Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Freeman Spogli Institute Israel Studies Winter Quarter webinar series. My name is Amichai Magen. I am the visiting fellow in Israel Studies here at FSI, and together with Professor Larry Diamond, we will be hosting this exciting new series from now until mid-March, exploring various aspects of contemporary Israeli politics, society, and security challenges. Professor Diamond is unable to participate today, but he will be back as host and moderator in future webinars. And now for today's topic and today's speaker. The title of our opening webinar is, What a Difference a Year Makes, Israel's Traumatic 2023 and What to Expect in 2024. The past year will be remembered by virtually all Israelis, I think, as a deeply traumatic year. And the beginning of 2024 hasn't let off. So much has happened in Israel and to Israelis over the past year that it is a real challenge to try to take stock of what has happened, where we are now, and where we might be going. Over the coming weeks, we will dive into a variety of more specific aspects of a complex and rapidly evolving domestic, regional, and international reality for Israel. But today, we want to have a big picture conversation about Israel before, during, and after 2023. And to do that, we knew we wanted to open this webinar series with Haviv Retig Gur. Haviv is the Times of Israel's senior analyst. And for anyone who follows his writing and podcast appearances, as I do, one of the most informed and astute observers of modern Jewish history and identity, Israeli politics, Middle East diplomacy, and the US-Israel relationship. And Haviv, who is typically normally based in Jerusalem, actually joins us from uh, London uh, today. Shalom Haviv, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. E even if the background is a hotel room. Yeah. and. Uh, Thank you for doing this. I know these are extremely uh, difficult and, and busy times for you, and uh, we really appreciate you making uh, uh, the time. So, Chaviv, before we jump into the national and regional politics, perhaps we could start with the uh, personal and the familial. Uh, you are based in Israel, although you travel uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, let me start with a question that all Israelis uh, start conversations with these days. Mashlom Ha, how are you? How are you feeling? How are you? How is your family? Uh, what what is what is the mood uh, that you are in and that you feel that Israel is uh, in uh, these days, these difficult days? It's a good question. It's a surprisingly complex question. Um, in some ways, we are very much profoundly in in this event. Nothing has changed. Nothing has ended. Um, two um, of my wife's brothers are in the war. Two days ago, there were 21 uh, soldiers killed um, when two buildings um, collapsed on them in the middle of a particular kind of battle. And um, it was triggered by an RPG strike on a tank adjacent to the soldiers. And um, in the tank, further back in the tank column were one of uh, my wife's brothers, one of my brothers-in-law. Um, and so, you know, we have family in danger when you have the largest reserve call up in the history of the Israeli army. Most Israeli families have someone um, on the line, uh, either in Gaza or uh, on the northern border waiting for that escalation that just about everyone expects, right? Something like 86,000 Israeli residents of towns and villages on the northern border aren't there, have, have fl essentially fled for uh, over 100 days, and about 100,000 Lebanese on the other side of the border have fled their homes. And so there's a very broad expectation that, that the war will expand to the north. Um, my own family is invested. You know, there's literally blood on the line. We uh, have good friends who suffered terribly on October 7th. Um, a family, uh, a friends of ours, the family lost um, three people killed on October 7th and eight taken hostage, including a three-year-old girl and an eight-year-old boy and a 12-year-old girl. All but one of those eight were released in the in the first hostage exchange. 
So we're we're within this. We're deep within the event. Having having said that, you know, we're also feeling the social capital that Israelis have, the close knit communities, the strong, um, the large families, the strong civil society um, that has really swung into action in astonishing and measurable ways. Uh, and that Israelis are relying on now, literally, you know, day by day. So we're going to be okay, uh, but it is not, you know, it's not an easy time, obviously. A tremendous amount of uh, pain and anxiety. People are going from from one funeral uh, to to the other. At my home university, at Reichman University in Herzliya, we've lost uh, several students, uh, both at the Nova event and subsequently uh, in in the war. Um, and, uh, and, and on top of that, um, there is the constant uh, awareness of uh, possible uh, escalation um, uh, leading potentially to an all-out uh, war with Hezbollah and, and, and even uh, with Iran, these multiple fronts. We've seen uh, rockets fired uh, and uh, drones fired from, from as far as uh, Yemen uh, by the Houthis. Uh, so yeah, the, the 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 mood is is one of anxiety, but as as you say, uh, Javier, also one of incredible societal resilience, um, and uh, a spirit of voluntarism that I think um, is is very special, uh, perhaps not unique to Israel, but but is felt very uh, very deeply uh, in and, Israel. Uh, and by the way, it crosses all boundaries. It, it is among our Arab colleagues at my newspaper. Uh, my newspaper publishes also in, in Arabic and Hebrew and English. Um, and, and they are volunteering and they're helping and they're being helped. And um, uh, the Druze community, the Bedouin um, lost uh, those 21 soldiers killed two days ago, came from every, their names were released. And one of the astonishing things, people actually sat down and produced maps of Israel and where they came from. They came from the right, they came from the left, they came from Ashkenazi Jews and Mizrahi Jews, they were Jews and Arabs, um, there were immigrants and and 12th generation um, Jerusalemites, there were every kind from every part of the Israeli socioeconomic strata, every single kind of Israeli was represented in those 21 soldiers. And so the, the it is a social capital question, and also everyone is experiencing this we've seen in uh, the uh, Arab Israeli community, which is, for obvious reasons, have, is in a very complicated moment. Uh, to uh, some significant portion of their identity is Palestinian, and and different parts of the community in different ways. But nevertheless, we're seeing among them both a tremendous amount of sympathy for what's happening to Gazans, also the highest rates of identification with Israel than we've ever seen. And so it's it's very complex, but. I think the societal strength is coming through in every in every direction. Yeah, and let me just mention that this time next week we will be having a conversation with my friend Mohammad Darausha, uh, um, who is an Israeli uh, Arab um, who has dedicated his life to building a, a shared society uh, in Israel, and we will be discussing e exactly uh, the complexity um, that Israeli Arabs, who make up uh, twenty percent of the Israeli population, are experiencing uh, at this at this moment. It, it's uh, Haviv, as, as we can already establish, it's very we, we could go down a whole number of uh, avenues in this conversation and and, and have uh, uh, no shortage of material uh, to to discuss. But um, I do want to 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 zoom out a little bit and to help us um, get a sense of how you see what has happened to Israel. Uh, over the past uh, year. Perhaps we might start with the formation uh, of the, uh, I'm tempted to say the current coalition government, but it's not even the current coalition government, the, 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 the coalition government that came into power on December 29th, 2022, um, Benjamin Netanyahu's sixth uh, coalition uh, government as prime minister. And perhaps the starting point uh, for that uh, that timeline uh, would be January 4th, uh, 2023, uh, the day uh, on which uh, the newly appointed Justice Minister Yariv Levine uh, announced uh, his uh, intention to overall 
the uh, Israeli uh, judicial system, uh, what some people uh, saw as uh, some uh, kind of uh, corrective to an imbalance of power between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, and others saw, saw as a direct uh, assault on the rule of law and a destruction of the separation of powers uh, in, in, in Israel. Uh, it's always very difficult to know when, where to start the story, but I want to take us uh, back to, to what you've described as a roller coaster uh, year and how you think about where we were on the eve of January 4th, 2023, versus where we are uh, today as a, as a state, as a society, as a country. I know it's a big Yuval Noah Harari, <laughs> big history kind of question. Um, but I've been thinking about this uh, a lot, and um, I I've kind of identified this double paradox um, in um, the where Israel was this time last year, which I would like to share with you and get your get your thoughts on. So the double paradox that I, I identify uh, would be uh, domestic and regional or international, sort of a, an internal paradox and then an external foreign policy paradox. I think that if I sort of look at Israel's experience uh, over the last uh, few years, I, I see this contrast that I find very difficult to reconcile uh, domestically between, on the one hand, an incredible material success. If you look at is Israel's GDP per capita, it has doubled since 2007. If you look at uh, global indicators of human well-being, the Human Development Index, you look, look at life expectancy in Israel, you look at the um, uh, Global Happiness Index, at the beginning of 2023, Israel ranks fourth in the world on the uh, Global Happiness Index. So there's a tremendous sense of uh, well-being on, on the one hand, and yet at the same time, a, a, a deep sense of anxiety and vulnerability. And what do, we, what do we make of that? How do we think about that domestically? I think that there's a fascinating uh, external uh, mirror image of that uh, paradox. And that is that when you look at Israel's external relations and diplomatic relations over the last few years, they too are characterized by this uh, schizophrenia. On the one hand, we see historic uh, gains in peacemaking and normalization, uh, flowering of relations with the uh, Arab uh, world. Uh, on the eve of October 7th, it looked as if we were getting pretty close to the possibility of full normalization of relations with Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia. And then at the same time, uh, uh, as as this positive momentum was was going on, we also saw a rise. I would argue, perhaps an unprecedented uh, rise in the type and uh, diversity of security threats that Israel uh, was facing. What we now call the Ring of Fire that Iran has sort of constructed around Israel in the north with Hezbollah, Hamas, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza, the Houthis, the various militias based in uh, Syria, in Iraq. And, and, and so um, there is this paradox between progress towards uh, greater security and normalization uh, with uh, a, a, um, a, a growing set of, of, of security threats. Is, is that a useful way to, to, to think about the roller coaster um, that you and I spoke about? Um, I, I like uh, paradoxes because paradoxes tell us we don't understand something and something is happening that we're not seeing and driving to apparent contradictions or a, an apparent contradiction that obviously in, in, in a deeper understanding is, isn't, doesn't contradict. Um, so on, on the domestic front, um, we are a country, as you said, with tremendous internal strengths, tremendous social capital. We don't quite know why. We are a democracy that is unusual in its lack of institutions, lack of checks and balances, lack of a constitutional tradition, even on the British model of, you know, common law constitutional tradition. Um, we uh, have no Philadelphia convention. We have no moment where Israeli thinkers 
sat down and thought through our democracy in any serious public way. Um, we're just kind of automatically a democracy from day one without the institutions, constitutions, or moment of decision to become a democracy and, and even a vocabulary for talking about it properly. And we never stop to ask why. Why is Israel a democracy? I think that one of the reasons we don't ask is, is sometimes um, the biggest questions are the ones we don't notice. We, there, it, we have built a set of assumptions around them that we never interrogate and so we don't notice them. Um, I think that there's a perception, certainly in the English speaking world, but but even I think in Israel, there's some sort of uh, some perception that um, diaspora Jews tend to the liberal, especially American Jews who are now 80% of the diaspora. And so everybody knows that Jews are liberal. And so obviously Israel is a democracy. They forget that Israel is, of course, the other Jews. It's not the Jews who spent a century living in Western liberalism and discovered in frankly, Anglophone liberalism in the U.S. and Canada, um, a homeland, not quite a homeland in the U.S., but a homeland in American liberalism that sort of saved them from history, essentially, saved them from the 20th century. Israeli Jews are the Jews who went through the 20th century. They're the Jews of Yemen and Morocco and Syria. They're the Jews of Tsarist Russia. They are the Jews who fled the Nazis. In 1935 alone, 65,000 German-speaking Jews land in British Palestine. Israelis are the product of all the promises of modernity and liberalism collapsing. And we arrive in Israel, and people who had, by a huge majority, never voted in their lives, the vast majority of Israelis come as refugees from places that are not democratic. From day one, they, they vote, they believe in democracy, they act as, as a democratic country, and that's even though the first time they've ever voted is as Israelis. And so we don't ask the question of, of why. So I think there is this contradiction in, inherent in the judicial reform. We have all the strengths of a free market. We have all the strengths of a democracy. We have all the military strengths of a democracy. Democracies uh, tend to not expect wars. They tend to be surprised. But they also tend to then be able to mobilize for a war in ways that dictatorships can't. And so democracies tend to be very effective at war. Um, the very fact that democracies now largely face guerrilla and insurgent and you know non-conventional uh, adversaries is because they defeated every other kind, and there's just no other way to face them. Mm. And so Israel has all of these strengths that we don't quite understand, and I think that the past year has sharpened and revealed a great deal about where those strengths come from. And I think the same is true geopolitically. Um, what we learned on October 7th, we woke up to some of our assumptions about Hamas. We woke up to assumptions about the region. We woke up to assumptions about Iran, that they were deterred, that our firepower deterred Hezbollah, that our firepower would see us through. And we discovered that, in fact, the other side is not actually deterred by our firepower. These are ideologies that are systematically demolishing their own polities. What could we possibly do to them that would be worse than what the Houthis have already done to Yemen? And so we woke up to a much more complex challenge and a much more frightening challenge. One of the reasons that there's a discrepancy between how Israelis think about this war and how I think much of the West, or certainly the left in the West, thinks of the war is the David Goliath question. If your frame is the CNN footage from Gaza, Israel's Goliath and, and Gaza is David. But the Israeli perception, I'm not saying one is right or wrong, what fascinates me is the disagreement. I mean, I do have an opinion, but my opinion is not the interesting part here. Israelis woke up to this vast array of proxies, exactly like you said, and are manifestly the David in this scenario of a Middle East where, uh, you know, essentially this expansionist empire is coming to destroy them to the last man, woman, and child. And so um, there are these different um, perceptions. I, I think that we can resolve them. I think that if we begin to understand the roots of Israeli democracy, we understand judicial reform, and we also understand why the paradox is a paradox. I want to um, I want to suggest a theory of Israeli democracy. Okay, nobody fall off your chair, please. <laughs> it's just a theory of Israeli democracy. Um, Israeli democracy is a primordial democracy, and what I mean by that is. It is a democracy of the type that um, for, is forged out of underlying social realities without necessarily conscious elites sitting down and constructing it on paper. 
in how, how did British democracy come about? It came about, um, traditionally it starts in the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta is a moment where the nobility defeat the armies of the king, uh, of King John, and force King John to sign a document, the Great Charter, that gives some rights to the nobility. Those rights then and to the church. Those rights then slowly expand and a parliament is formed around these, these rights of the nobility and access to parliament and to the vote slowly expands. And over 800 years, you get British liberal democracy. Um, but one of the fascinating points that um, Francis Fukuyama raises in uh, The Origins of Political Order about the Magna Carta, and I say that because that's Isra where Israeli democracy comes from. He says that you know, a great, there are two great questions that, that one can ask about Britain. The first question is, um, why is Britain a, why would this liberal democracy pretend to be a theocratic dictatorship, right? This is, in the Middle East, we have so many dictators that pretending to have elections. Britain, pretend, the theater of government in every way, the, the, the prime minister's speech to the nation is literally read by the king, as if the king wrote the speech. But everybody knows that the guy in the back in, in the House of Commons is actually running the country. Why the theater of dictatorship? And he suggests that it's because um, the story of that war and the story of the defeat of King John and the Magna Carta was that it would not have helped the nobles, once they defeated the king, to cut off his head. Because a fundamental and profound social reality um, existed that would have simply appointed a new king. In the, the British aristocracy was very localized and spoke the local dialects wherever they were and had the loyalty of locals throughout England. And the king was essentially just the local Lord of London, which was the center of commerce and power and population. And so if you kill the king, there'll be a new Lord in London and he'll be the king again and you haven't solved the problem. And the king can't defeat all the nobles assembled against him because there'll be a lot of different nobles and together they can build an army. Hundreds of years of English history are the history of London versus the, the rest. When the rest unite, London can't force its will. And that profound underlying social reality forced the creation of a kind of standoff that at, at Runnymede in 1215 is, is literally at sword point. And around that military standoff, they created over the decades and then centuries institutions, uh, which became English democracy. And so when the English king goes down the street in some parade and the English in this phenomenally liberal democracy cheer their theocratic dictator, what they're actually cheering is the one half of the standoff which is the actual process by which their democracy was created. So it's a more complex picture. I want to suggest that that primordial democracy created from social realities was our democracy. And that's what was threatened by the judicial reform. And Israelis have such a poor language of democracy that we couldn't have a real discussion about any of this. Israel is a country constructed of tribes, of wildly diverse tribes. We have religious tribes among the Jews, ethnic tribes among the Jews. We have the huge ethnic divide between Jews and Arabs, the religious divide between Jews and Christians and Muslims and Druze. We have all of these profound divides. And we, because this is the Middle East, and because even most of the Jews in Israel come from the Middle East, we tend to think in very Middle Eastern terms about identity, especially about these underlying assumptions about society. And so we actually tend to live apart. We tend to study in different school systems. Our kids tend to grow up apart. We look a lot more like Lebanon than we do like, I don't know what, Portugal or you know Switzerland, socially, I mean. And so we are a tribal society. That is as true within the Jews, within the Arabs, as it is between Jews and Arabs. And so Israel is this very tribal society. It has always been thus. The Jews who immigrate from many different countries, they don't instantly merge together. There's tremendous tensions to this day. The Likud party runs on Ashkenazi Mizrahi tension. And a country divided in that way, those tribes are the centrifugal force that pulls us apart. We are also a majority Jewish country, and most of the Jews got there by essentially having to flee somewhere. 20th century for Jews is essentially the experience of learning English, learning Hebrew, or dying. Those are the three options left to the Jews of the 20th century. In the Eastern Hemisphere, you either learned Hebrew or died. Apologies to the French Jewish community, which is the exception that proves the rule. 
um, it after the Holocaust fills up from the Jews fleeing North Africa. In other words, it, it, there is a non-Hebrew, non-English speaking community in the world that's fairly large, but it's not so large that it, it, it and its own experience is the same kind of refugee experience. And so we have, that's a centripetal force. So just the point is we have this centrifugal force pulling us apart, our deep tribalism. You see it at every election. You see it every time Israelis fight on Twitter. And a centripetal force pulling us together, which is the refugee experience. One of the profound taboos of Israeli history is the taboo. It's a taboo rooted in solidarity in the refugee experience. It's a taboo of Jewish on Jewish violence. So, for example, our high schoolers are more likely to learn in depth moments when the Jews killed other Jews, not, not criminality, I mean political violence, than they are the 56 war, which in 1956 felt existential. Um, they will learn about Emil Greenzweig, a left-wing anti-war activist during the Lebanon war, killed by a right-wing pro-government activist. They will learn about the Rabin assassination. They will learn about the Altalena. They will learn about these moments where Israelis killed, Israeli Jews killed other Israeli Jews. The deep taboo of Jewish on Jewish violence is a signal of that sense of solidarity rooted in what is Israel? Israel is the place where Jews are safe. And so the violation of Israeliness is when Jews kill other Jews. And so that is a taboo and a thing that we sit and teach our kids almost as much as the great wars, or in many cases, I think even more. Long story short, Israeli democracy is a series of informal institutions. We have almost no checks and balances in our system. We have less than any parliamentary system you've ever heard of. We don't even have a direct election of MPs. The MPs are appointed by the heads of the parties that sit in the government. The Israeli executive almost to a, in every party literally appoints the legislative majority that is supposedly supposed to rein them in. And nevertheless, we have a democracy. And the reason we have a democracy is that in our politics, we have this um, national party list system. I'm sorry, it says Stanford on the banner, so I'm just getting a little bit academic. I apologize. I'm stopping in three sentences. Um, it's um, We have a national party list election system, which means that voters don't vote for a member of the par of, of a party or a representative. They vote for a party list. They don't choose the list by and large. And the reason we have that system is that Israelis basically expect themselves and are expected by, by the country to vote their tribe. We are divided into these tribes, the Sephardi ultra-Orthodox, the Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox, the secular, urban, progressive Arab, the religious, conservative, Bedouin Arab. These tribes that divide us all are expressed as national political party lists. And so our Knesset, our parliament, our electoral system itself, which has almost no checks and balances, has one immense check and balance. And it is the check and balance at the heart of everything. And it's the check and balance produced by that centrifugal, centripetal tension. It is the check and balance of tribes. Our Knesset is a place where all the tribes come together and begin to negotiate and mediate our lives together. Israel is a Lebanon, except functional, <laughs> except it works. In Lebanon, it doesn't work. But the basic underlying structure of society is the same, and the political reality, the political structures that flow from it are the same. And so in judicial reform, what explains this immense strength, this immense Israeli liberalism? Israel is, sub, is, is simultaneously one of the most liberal Western nations. Uh, we had gay common law marriage in the 90s. How many Americans or Canadians or Western Europeans can say that? And the most conservative. We have an ultra-Orthodox school system that doesn't teach math and English and Sharia court system. No Western democracy can say that. So we are both the most liberal and the most conservative. Why? Because some of our cultural and religious and ethnic tribes are profoundly liberal and where they live is a very liberal polity. And some are profoundly conservative and where they live is a very conservative. And so we are this divided tribe. And in the Knesset, we basically live out that shared existence and it's mediated through that politics. What the judicial reform proposal did because the Likud party which has tremendously competent people, not all of them, but, but many of them are competent, thoughtful, serious people. Professors of law helped produce that reform. 
but they don't have a basic theory of Israeli democracy. They don't have the basic theory that there is a balancing act in Israel, not between institutions. There's a balancing act between tribes. And so they began to slowly dismantle the power of one of those of those institutions, the, the court, which is one of the only real checks on this almost unitary legislative executive. And they did it in the name of a religious Jewish majority. One of the, uh, the single identifiable factor that correlates the most to whether you voted for the coalition parties of that government or the opposition parties is religiosity. The most religious Jews voted for this coalition. The secular Jews slash non-Jews voted for the opposition parties. Religious Jews were dismantling the only mechanism by which when you get a majority in this system, the others can make sure that their rights are protected. And so judicial reform was a moment where um, the informality of Israeli democracy all of the gaps, all of the, the fact that we never sat down and thought about this for 10 seconds. We just kind of automatically produced ourselves a, a, a slightly more functional form of Lebanon because that's what everybody kind of understood and came from and it worked from day one. And we never sat and thought, well, what if people go in that or the other, right? And so the, the political right compared our Supreme Court to the Supreme Court of America or Britain or Germany or, and yeah, it doesn't look like those Supreme Courts, but nothing we have looks like those. We are a country that has tremendous strengths and absolutely no curiosity about ourselves to figure out where they come from. And sometimes that means that we start to break things because we don't really have a good sense of how, who we are, how we function. Aviv, uh, we could spend hours uh, on these questions of constitutionalism, political philosophy. I think there's really fascinating threads to pull on here regarding not only the fact that most Israelis came from cultures and from contexts that had no tradition of, of, of democracy and were socialized into uh, democracy, but Jews don't have a very long, um, uh, long experience, certainly not long continuous experience with sovereignty. And I think that we always need to remember that uh, we're 75 years young, uh, and that we're still uh, asking, who are we? What, what brings us together? How should we live here together? Uh, just given the incredible diversity uh, of, uh, of, of, of Israeli society. I also think there's a, cer a certain kind of Israeli naivete about the state and especially about executive power. Israelis, uh, when they talk about their state, they, they call it Hamedina. Yeah? And Hamedina, the state, is uh, is is also us. It's sort of a hybrid between us, the people, and then the the uh, the mechanism uh, of the uh, of the state. And I think that one of the uh, byproducts of the fact that Israelis view their state as a miracle is that they tend to assume that it's benign and it's always going to do the right thing. And therefore, perhaps we don't need as many checks and balances. Israelis are not as fearful of executive power as the American founding fathers. And sometimes they don't put as much emphasis on the need for the rule of law and separation of powers because they tend to assume that Hamedina, the state, is, is always gonna be benign and is always gonna protect them. Anyway, we could, we could this is this is right, no, the, the same word means both state and country. Precisely. And so you can be, you declare your loyalty to the state and people but at the times of Israel, we have this problem of translating Hamidina, and sometimes mm -hmm. we have to translate it country and sometimes state, and, and it's not mm -hmm. an easy question. Sometimes it inter because when you don't have separation of the words, sometimes Israelis themselves confuse what they're saying about it. So, so we've touched on some of the deep uh, themes of um, success and, and vulnerability, and there's much more to be said uh, about that. And hopefully we can continue to have this conversation in the future. But I want to bring you to October 7th, and I want to get your sense um, of the meaning of October 7th, uh, given everything that we've just uh, spoken about, and then the consequences uh, of October 7th, both for uh, Israeli democracy and for possible realignment of Israeli uh, politics, but also help us to understand the stakes of October 7th and the subsequent 
uh, war, which is today in, in its 110th day. This is by far Israel's uh, longest war with, with one exception, and that is the War of Independence of 1948-1949. It's a war that has already tragically claimed the lives of over 27 thousand people, which it's, we should uh, say very clearly, the majority of whom are, uh, are Palestinians. And on both the uh, Palestinian and the Israeli side, uh, the proportion uh, between uh, fighters who have been killed and civilians who have been killed leans towards the civilians. Very, very painful, uh, very, very, very tragic. But I want to get your sense of uh, what is at stake and, and what this war means um for uh the future of uh or at least the short-term future of israeli politics as you as you see it and all of that I all of that, that in, in sort of 10 minutes <laughs> at most well we talked too much about democracy i apologize yeah. everyone yeah. um yeah. I, the um i think that um you know, we've all been saying it in the same way, and i'm just going to repeat it just for a minute because i think it's it's vital a part of the answer um, we woke up on October 7th, and what we woke up to was our own misunderstanding of what's happening. We thought we were very comfortable in our strength. We thought that our um, firepower, frankly, um, made us safe, that our enemies were deterred, that Iran was play-acting the construction of all these proxies uh, because they're you know, whatever the journalists keep using these words like radical and extremist, and it's ways for journalists to sort of tag something so they don't have to actually interpret it and think about it. I'm a journalist. I, I'm not telling people, you know, I'm, I am sometimes have to tag people because I have to go write about something else and I have to mention what these people are. But nevertheless, it, it's a way to not actually think carefully about it. So these, these extreme Israelis were not thinking carefully about it. These T terrorist regimes or whatever um, were building these these proxies, but they wouldn't dare attack us because we could rain down fire on them, and they knew it, and we knew it, and so they were deterred. On October seventh, we discovered they were not deterred, and they knew they had a much more clever sense of our own power. They knew that sometimes vast kinetic power, firepower, is so vast it's unusable. Um, Something that I, I learned from Edward Lutvak, the, the strategist and uh, military analyst, um, who says, you know, sometimes countries that have nukes fight wars, even though they have nukes. But nukes are unusable in those wars because they're too powerful. And so too powerful systems actually make you less safe. Um, and it, it doesn't happen always. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens sometimes. What Hamas has done over the last 17 years in Gaza I'll put it a different way. The only thing Hamas has done in 17 years in Gaza, to which all of its efforts, all of its taxation, all of its military wing, all of its social programming, all of the things it was doing, all were bent on doing one thing. And that was constructing the battlefield of Gaza, thinking of Gaza with its civilian population, entire cities as a future battlefield and building that battlefield for this war. Those tunnels are something like twice the size of the London tube. They are vast, astonishingly well built. It is a massive investment of the Gazan economy. Hamas is a, an opponent that is unique in the history of warfare. We've seen tremendous numbers of uh, guerrilla fighters, war, you know, guerrilla uh, tactics on the battlefield, really from the days of Alexander the Great. We have also seen standing armies that have states behind them that can wield vast resources. Guerrilla fighters attack and then hide in the civilian population. States can bend, and bend an entire economy to a war effort and produce massive, bring massive resources to bear on the battlefield. Hamas is the first time in the history of warfare to that extent that you have an enemy that's both. It controlled a territory and an economy for 17 years, which it bent to a guerrilla war. And so it was capable of producing a battlefield underneath the above ground battlefield, of building Gaza for this special kind of war um, at a scale never faced before by any standing army. And the Israelis discovered on October 7th that what that actually means is they looked at our massive firepower and they said, okay, we're gonna build a battlefield in which your massive firepower is your crutch, is your, is your um, handicap. And 
that is a horrifying tragedy because what the result of that was was that we thought until October 7th that they were deterred by our firepower. On October 7th, we discovered we had been deterred by our own firepower. We could not imagine something that they would do to us or some threat that they could possibly pose to us that would make it worth it for us to go after them with all the costs that would be incurred. Were we deterred because uh, of our firepower or were we um, lulled into uh, a false um, conception, what Israelis like to call the conceptia, that we could strike a deal with, with Hamas and we could offer work permits and allow Qatari money to come into uh, Gaza, that we could sort of tame and moderate uh, Hamas because ultimately they wanted to rule and they wanted uh, to govern. So what I mean, the, the failure, I think, it's a, failure I think the so two are dependent on each other. Okay, okay. In other words, because we could not imagine going after them in Gaza, because the way they had constructed Gaza, that cost would be unimaginable and unbearable to Gazan civilians, and the knock-on cost to us would be unbearable for us. Therefore, we went looking and believing in other options, which turned out to be incorrect. But what does that mean that those options were incorrect? that we actually should have gone storming into Gaza with all the IDF's firepower four years ago, five years ago, eight years ago? What does that mean? They had used our own firepower to deter us. And when we woke up to that reality, just, I mean, morally, okay, what that means is that they committed two atrocities on October 7th, and one is an order of magnitude larger than the other. One they committed against us, and that's the small one. The large one was after building Gaza the way they did as rulers for 17 years, triggering a war with us in which we had to, we believe we had no choice but to remove them from Gaza at any cost. And they are the ones who set the cost at that unbearable level. That is not an attempt to exonerate Israel. I don't know if every airstrike was legitimate or every, I don't know if there are no mistakes. I'm absolutely convinced that some portion of the, I happen to think it's 6% of the war, you know, of the 20,000 airstrikes or whatever it is. And 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 critics of Israel might say it's 86%. I I, I don't know. I, I, I truly, I'm not an expert in the military affairs but, and I don't but, need to exonerate. But I want but, to say that there was no way to do this without massive civilian toll. And that is literally Hamas's one strategy for survival. They don't yeah. have another strategy. And so we woke up to that reality at this micro level of Hamas. And I say micro because Hezbollah is that very thing in order of magnitude more powerful. Those tunnels, 150,000 rockets, every single one of them buried under the 200 villages of South Lebanon. Every single one. How do we go after those rockets? We learned with Hamas that every asset they built was going to be used. None of it was ever deterred. Well, how can we possibly look at Hezbollah and not think that every single one of those rockets is going to be used? What, what other, how would we be a responsible government or state or country if, if we didn't assume that they're going to use it all? And so Israel woke up to an existential moment, a moment of being threatened on five or six fronts all at once, a moment in which a regime that is seeking the redemption of Islam, the return into God's grace, Islam's weakness in the modern age, its struggles with modernity, are interpreted by the ideologues of both Hamas's ideological progenitors of the Muslim Brotherhood, but also by the Iranian revolutionaries who borrowed some of these ideas from the Sunnis. Don't tell them, they'll get insulted. But the point is, um, they interpret Islamic weakness as distance from God, and they, and they I mean, I'm, I'm not saying this about this is this is very common that's their speeches and and therefore the return of islam as a force a powerful force in geopolitics a, a worldly powerful force as a return into god's grace and therefore the destruction of this uh, uh, in this enemy who should be weak but has been capable of pushing back islam showing islam's distance from islam's god namely the jews this enemy has to be swept away as the beginning of islam's renewal 
you have a regime that thinks that and is actively demolishing four Arab countries in the construction of Shia proxies to carry it out using a double digit percentage of its economy to do so, that's one heck of a threat. And that's what we woke up to. The 21 soldiers who died two days ago died for a reason. They died because the Air Force no longer uses uh, certain kinds of missiles in airstrikes in Gaza. And it doesn't use those missiles because it's holding back and preserving the arsenal. And it's preserving the arsenal because there's a war coming in the north. And so Israel did not wake up to a war in Gaza. Israel woke up to a vast war in which even though Hamas is Sunni and Palestinian, is deeply embedded into that Iranian array of proxies. On October 7th, the Nukba force crossed the fence with satellite photographs. They don't have satellites, and it wasn't printouts from Google Maps. The Iranians supplied it. The Iranians helped train. The Iranians helped. The Iranians didn't know it was happening that day because um, Sinwar successfully compartmentalized. Um, Hamas's political leadership didn't know October 7 was happening until many hours into it actually happening um, because of the compartmentalization out of fear of Israeli intelligence. But so we woke up to this vast enemy. And I have to say, we also woke up to the startling resilience of our new friends. And so you talked about the paradox at the beginning. We are having more peace and also suddenly more war all at once. What we're actually seeing, I think, is an internal struggle within Islam, Sunni Islam, certainly in the Arab world and Iran, for what the future of that Islam is. Israel is a uh, proxy for that larger war. A relationship with Israel, neither the Saudis nor the Iranians actually care about real life Jews living in this actual strip of land. What they care about is what it represents in this larger struggle for the meaning of Islam and Islam's encounter with modernity. The Saudis and the Emiratis um, over the last month have said, and at first they said it quietly to journalists like me, and then they started saying it out loud. They said, we will come and help rebuild Gaza the day after. In Middle Eastern speak, that means finish the damn job. Get rid of Hamas. We will clean up. One of Israel's great challenges in Gaza in, in terms of the day after is de-radicalization. How does, we can't bring a new government to Gaza. No faction that comes riding into Gaza on the back of an Israeli tank will be legitimate. And so we don't actually know what to do the day after. The Biden administration wants to hear our solutions for the day after. The Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of Britain, wants to hear the day after. We don't have such plans. We're actually quite confused about the day after. Our priority is to get rid of this mortal threat called Hamas, and it's a mortal threat because it's embedded in this larger array. But nevertheless, um, the Saudis are telling us we actually know how to get rid of, how to de-radicalize a Sunni Arab society and how to get rid of this Muslim Brotherhood branch called Hamas. We did it in our own society. After 9-11, the Saudis turned, pivoted profoundly and quickly and very aggressively and went after uh, mosques and imams and networks and madrasas and de-radicalized their society as a conscious choice. The Emirati is the same. And so what they're saying to the Israelis is, this war is a war between one vision of Islam and another vision of Islam. If you get rid of the material, worldly uh, Hamas, we will know how to get rid of the idea or the ideas or the, the story Hamas tells Palestinians about this religious redemption on the other side of dead Jews. We will fix that. And so the resilience of that, the Saudis saying to the BBC, absolutely the Abraham Accords are coming back as soon as the war is over. Even the conversation now about a path to Palestinian statehood, the way the Saudis are framing it is we will come in and start to produce that civil society, that de-radicalization. In other words, a path to Palestinian statehood, not just that gives Palestinians a horizon, but that gives the Israelis a new Palestinian politics that the Israeli public, never mind ideologues or the right or the politics, but the public can believe in. So we are seeing tremendous resilience on that side because they're not actually fighting for us and they don't care about us. They're fighting for the future of themselves. And on the other side, Iran, um, I think feeling quite paranoid and scared. The fact that over the last week, we've seen Iranian missile strikes from Iranian soil with Iranian military 
on Pakistan, on Iraq, on Syria, and the fact that we've seen Iraq and Pakistan take issue with it, and Pakistan threatened to go to the UN Security Council. Iran is lashing out. Iran feels um, threatened. Israel turns its attention next to Hezbollah. Hezbollah is the jewel in the crown of this Iranian effort in which it spent so much blood and so much treasure. The regime can be destabilized if it is seen as being pushed back by this Israel that is now awake and willing to expend itself on this long war because it genuinely thinks its survival is at stake. To Iran, first of all, Islamic renewal is at stake. Second of all, Shiism is at stake. And so um, this is going to get much worse before it gets any better. But I think Israel is safer today than it was on October 6th, if only because the threat was there. They were never deterred. We were asleep. We are not, we're now awake. It feels worse, but the actual objective situation for us, at least, is better. Yeah, it, it, feels, it feels very, uh, uh, very, very painful. And uh, I'm mindful of the time, and I'm mindful that we have uh, questions that have been uh, submitted uh, for you, uh, Khaviv, I want to uh, invite um, anybody who wants to uh, still pose some, some questions. We're going to turn to uh, Q&A very, very soon. But I want to loop us back into the domestic. And uh, if you could, I know, again, this is a big topic, but it seems to me that one of the... Um, key variables that defines this particular war and that makes it different from previous wars is not necessarily the number of civilians who have been killed and, and horribly uh, treated, not uh, even the issue um, of the kidnapped, which is tearing Israeli society's guts from the from the inside out, but it's the combination of a sense of, of an existential struggle, um, a, a a sense of uh, uh, being the subject um, of uh, genocidal hatred, um, and uh, coupled with with the tremendous military capabilities in the hands of uh, not only Hamas, but Hezbollah, uh, Houthis, Iran, and other, and other proxies. So there is that threat, but then there's also this profound um, sense of mistrust in the current, as I see it, in the current Israeli leadership. Um, the reservoirs of what we wonkishly call in political science Input legitimacy, the sense that Israelis have that their, that their national institutions are there for them, that the social contract is uh, sound and will be uh, preserved, and the sense that um, uh, the people who stand at the head um, of the state, and specifically the prime minister, are really making all of their decisions in what they understand in good faith to be the best interest of uh, the state, th there's not a lot of faith in that at, at the moment. And, and that combination between the physical threat and, uh, and the question of trust, or rather lack of trust, uh, worries me deeply. Does it, does it worry you, Khaviv? And if so, how, how do you think about that? And we'll do that in maybe a couple of minutes and then turn to uh, Q&A. Okay. Um... It does worry me, but it's a self-correcting system. It's democracy. Netanyahu is um, Netanyahu's government has been shedding public trust really since January uh, 2023 because of the judicial reform. Netanyahu hasn't actually won a, a poll. I don't think a single poll. I read them all. Um, since January 2023, he hasn't won a poll in a year. And that shift of some... Five seats, 10 seats, depends on which poll, out of 120 seats in our Knesset, that shift of those five to 10 seats to the center from his right-wing coalition because of judicial reform and that loss of trust, um, that has now been added to by a shift of Likud voters rightward 
there was a poll about three days ago by a very respected pollster in one of the major media outlets um, that found Netanyahu's Likud with 18 seats and the two combined far right parties of Bitsala Smotr, Janita Merbengvir with 16. Mm-hmm. And they're rising and Likud is still falling. In other words, they, they, they are in polls, not at the ballot box, which is a different place with a different psychology. But nevertheless, in polls, they're overtaking Likud itself. Likud used to be two and a half times what they were together, and they are now overtaking Likud. That shedding of trust, Netanyahu went into October 7 with a trust deficit, and that even that expanded after October 7 because he's come to be identified with October 7. Perhaps, so the lack of trust is enormous. Perhaps we'll just add, and correct me if I'm wrong, you have access, we've both been uh, reading the polls, but some of those Likud votes are also heading in the other direction uh, towards uh, Benny Gantz and Blue and White. Uh, um, so it, About it, half of them. About half of them, right. So just, just that, we, that we have a sort of a, a, a sense of, of, of that. Likud dynamic. has been shedding votes in both directions. And we had a poll by the Midgam Institute, which is a, a respected pollster in Israel, um, that asked this fascinating, asked many questions, but one of them was this fascinating question. Um, what um, do, it took the four leaders of Israel or five leaders and it, and it said to them, it said to uh, respondents, do you think this person is right now primarily focused on the war or primarily focused on their own politics? The single most trusted person on the list was Defense Minister Yav Gala, 90-10, 90% he's focused on the war. The next in line was Benny Gantz, 80-20, focused on the war. The next in line, about 60-40, unfortunately, is, is uh, opposition leader Yair Lapid. I guess you could say in his defense, he's not actually in the government running the war. So maybe Israelis, naturally, even his own voters would think he's focused on politics. And the bottom of the, of the list is Benjamin Netanyahu, where it's 65-35 the other way. 65% he's focused on politics, 35% he's focused on the war. He's the prime minister in wartime. So there is a profound trust deficit. In parliamentary systems, I don't know exactly who our audience is here, but um, unless you come from outside the U.S. from a parliamentary system, this might be something hard to uh, see from the outside. In parliamentary systems, as a government declines in the polls, it becomes more stable. It becomes more stable because none of the coalition partners want to face the voters when they're dropping in the polls. And so that uh, incredible unpopularity of this government at this moment because of this combined year of judicial reform and then, which was such a radical version that alienated many Israelis, including centrist Likud voters, and then the war, which really has has come home to roost for Netanyahu in the minds of voters and in the minds of the public, um, that double whammy um, has stabilized this government, ironically, um, which is how you would expect it to work in a parliamentary system, but um, that only works so far, you, you reach a tipping point where if any one of the coalition partners concludes that the whole deal is going to fall anyway, there's a huge advantage to jumping first, because then you can shape the narrative of why you left, why it collapsed. It collapsed because you, Itamar Ben-Gvir, Betzalel Smotrich, one of the far-right critics of the Gaza policy of Netanyahu for the last 12 years or so, you broke up a government that you claim wasn't fighting Hamas aggressively enough, and then you will actually take massive advantage and, and seal in that right-wing flow of votes for the next election. Sure, Likud's not going to run the next government, but it wasn't going to anyway. You grow massively, and in two elections, maybe in three elections, you are a much more significant part of the Israeli political right. That calculation seems to be what is happening on the far right right now. And to prevent them from leaving his side, Netanyahu has begun a campaign about not allowing a Palestinian state to be formed. Netanyahu is now talking about, about a month ago, he gathered together members of Knesset of Likud in a Likud faction meeting, and he said to them, if I, and this is the campaign for his survival, if I fall, if Gantz is prime minister the day after the war, the Biden administration is going to cash in all the political capital it's spent helping us. And it's going to say, now you give me, so I can take this to the left wing of the Democratic Party and not lose Michigan in the election. You give me a horizon for the Palestinians. The Saudis are saying, 
if you give me that Palestinian state, I give you everything you've ever wanted in the region, right? And the Saudis aren't even saying a state. They're saying a path to a state by which they mean I will de-radicalize them for you and it will be a state that's actually safe for you. Mm. So everyone wants to play ball with Israel on this. Israel has to just show a willingness to have a political horizon for the Palestinians. Nobody thinks there's going to be a state in 10 years, at least. I mean, it's not a thing that any, there's no Palestinian political faction today that knows how to build a state. But Netanyahu has decided to pick a fight with all of our allies about whether or not we want a state, which to my mind is quite harmful for our position right now when we're still dependent on American missile shipments for the war with Hezbollah that might happen. Um, because he has to desperately hold hold together the right, or he falls immediately. Netanyahu is probably going to survive a while. The 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 moment I expect him to fall, again, uh, this is about trust. The families of the hostages who began a protest last week were themselves stunned that a hundred thousand Israelis joined them in the protest. Yeah, what were those hundred thousand Israelis doing? Because it's a silly thing to put pressure on a government to get the hostages out, because the government's not holding the hostages. And if Hamas thinks the government is under massive domestic pressure to get those hostages out, Hamas will up the cost, not lower the cost. And so these families are doing something that is massively detrimental to getting their own family members out. So what are they doing? And the simple answer is they no longer trust that this government is trying to get those hostages out. When you lose trust in the government, you start smacking the government around, which is how, you know, which is what a protest is in a democracy, right? Because they don't trust that Netanyahu really is focused on the well-being of their of their families. And so that that's small potatoes. Imagine the moment when it's not hostage families, which is a small number of families, 100, 200. Imagine the moment where all the victims, the f- 1,200 victims, all of their families, and all their extended families, and the 86,000 people in hotels for 110 days, and all the people who can't come back to the Gaza periphery communities, and all the people who care about those people, all take to the streets. And then you have a 700,000 protest that Netanyahu can't survive politically. So that there is a, a tipping point uh, that I think is, is going to happen. I, 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 I can't imagine it won't happen. Habib, I'm turning to um, the uh, questions that have been submitted, and I'm uh, I'm di- I'm dividing them into into categories. I'm going to read out two questions that relate to the hostages and and ask for your ask for your comment. Um, so I'm reading out uh, one question. Uh, Tel Aviv's Ayalon Highway is currently blocked by thousands of protesters. It seems that the current leadership will not be a partner with this potential threading of the needle vis-a-vis the Saudis and Emiratis. What will it take from the leadership perspective in Israel to make this happen? Okay, so that's more of a question about um, uh, an aspect that you've you've, you've spoken about, about the the, the calculus. Uh, I guess the answer here would be dep- would would be depending on the leadership right <laughs> and, and who's going to lead israel uh, over the coming year but please feel free to relate to that i do want to read out uh, one more question related relating to the hostages um does anyone have any real sense on the well-being of the hostages and if so is there any information you can share with us so perhaps you can you could uh, take that please um uh Khabib. Yeah, uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis, it'll be very easy for any government to thread that needle. Netanyahu himself is desperate to thread that needle, to make life very easy for the Saudis, to make it easy for Joe Biden. I mean, goodness, if we punish Joe Biden um, by now refusing, in principle, Palestinian self-determination, after he held that door open for us the way he did, Future presidents, even if they agree with us, even if our enemy is an enemy of civilization, like Hezbollah, which is this catastrophe for Lebanon, never mind for Israel, they simply won't trust us enough not to backstab them afterwards to support us. And so Netanyahu doesn't want to be now fighting, I I think, I think, I am not in his head, Um, I have been following his strategic thinking for many, many years, I think he understands that the Saudis need us to play the game. 
And um, I think that uh, he understands that you can't exact a cost from Joe Biden for helping us or the future presidents might not be as keen to help us, but he needs to survive. So Netanyahu is unique in the uh, array of his potential Israeli prime ministers in his inability right now for those political reasons. And it's a choice. I'm not exonerating him. He's choosing to uh, favor his politics over the what he what even he believes is the national interest. Uh, but nevertheless, he's the only one who needs to make that choice. If Gantz is the leader, the Saudis and Emiratis are desperate for the Abraham Accords. Not because, again, they are deep admirers of us and the cherry tomato we invented or whatever we, you know, we are very big admirers of ourselves. And I happen to think we have a right to be. But the Saudis and Emiratis, for their own powerful strategic uh, reasons and powerful self-interests, want that alliance and have said so. We want to triple down the day after they have said that. Um, and so uh, it'll happen. It'll happen. It'll be safe. Everybody in the Middle East wants Iran to fail. Have we anything, accept Iran. anything you can share with us uh, about what you believe to be the state of well-being of the hostages? About the hostages. We believe that some of the hostages are dead. Uh, it is hard to imagine that they're all alive. Um, the fact that um, Israel has gone in so aggressively um, this was pointed out by uh, someone who is familiar with some of the Israeli discussions on these questions, um, probably convinced some um, sort of pirate, not Hamas people, maybe sub-factions of Islamic Jihad or, you know, random uh, civilians who took hostages, convinced them to kill and hide hostages so that Israel doesn't find hostages with them and the soldiers potentially you know, bomb their house or take some kind of revenge. That is something that they fear. Uh, and so there's there's almost a, an absolute certainty that some hostages are simply dead and possibly disappeared forever and will never be found. The majority of the missing hostages, we believe, we have good reason to believe, are probably held by Hamas, probably held by Islamic Jihad, probably held at this point, as uh, the army over the last three days or four days has surrounded the center of Khan Yunis, and dropped leaflets to Hamas leaders um, hunkered down inside the center of Khan Yunus saying, look around, we're coming, um, are probably holding them to um, barter for their own survival. That is exactly how Israel wants this to go. And so if that is what's happening, Israel is very comfortable with that. Yoav Gallant said back in late October, the only way we get these hostages out is massive military pressure that forces Hamas to trade us hostages for another day uh, of, of, of life for Hamas leaders. And so that's the hope, that's the Israeli strategy, that's what Israel believes uh, is currently happening with some significant portion of the hostages. Thank you, Khaviv. And in three, three and a half minutes, we have two questions relating to um, US-Israel uh, relations, uh, and I'll read them both and please um, uh, refer to, uh, to them as you, as you uh, see fit. Uh, the first question is, how do Israelis view uh, what they are seeing happen on U.S. college campuses in media coverage and the resignation of Penn and Harvard's university presidents for failures to address anti-Semitism? Or is this a sideshow of concern primarily to American uh, Jews? And secondly, a uh, U.S.-related uh, question, uh, in a wider war, which you've described, what role will the United States play? Over to you. Um, then, yeah, the we'll is, yeah, the Israeli uh, view of what's happening on college campuses. Um, we um, are, of course, profoundly skeptical about the moral honesty of the people on college campuses screaming uh, for Palestinian liberation and and upset at the death of children in Gaza. Thousands of children have died in Gaza. Gaza is an absolute tragedy. It's horrifying. And if you want to be horrified by it and turn against war as per se, you know, as a as a thing and 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 criticize us ferociously and track our airstrikes to the point where you know exactly where we went wrong and then come to us with that case. Uh, I think that's a profoundly legitimate, moral, and even noble position. But that, of course, is not what's happening on college campuses. Uh, on college campuses, there is um, a, a opposition to children dying in Gaza that is also a support for Hamas. 
which means it's not opposition to the massacre of children because Hamas supports the massacre of children. It is people who see the deaths in Gaza but do not see the deaths in Yemen. It is people who think Israel is committing a genocide but China is not. It is people who pick and choose their morality based on a kind of moral cartoon running in their heads in which I am an avatar for their own inner anxieties in their societies, which is to say anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is always rational and it's always useful and it always feels moral. And it is nevertheless, and you identify it by massive double standards. I'm not saying that you can't be worried about Palestinians if you're not also equally worried about everything else. I'm saying that we're looking at a movement and an ideological um, collective that uh, in other places actually exonerates some of the some of the people doing the massacre, heroicizes some of the people doing the massacre, people chanting in favor of the Houthis, in favor of the Houthis, in support of Palestine. The Houthis led to uh, the deaths of tens of thousands of children and the reintroduction of slavery. So we Israelis know that, and we know it very clearly. And so we don't believe the world's moral attention directed at us. We genuinely, truly do not believe it's real. We believe it's about us, not about Palestinian suffering. Incidentally, I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with Palestinians, bitterly angry at the world, because they believe the same thing. They believe the world won't swing into action for them but only against Jews. And that is a horror show for them because it means that the kind of pressure they need to have temporary places to escape to from the war isn't going to come. And the aid they need that isn't ideological and filtered through organizations like UNRWA, the World Food Program can't get into Gaza, not because of the Israelis, because UNRWA has the monopoly and won't give it up. And so there are these, and you can't get a job with UNRWA on the ground in Gaza if Hamas doesn't okay it. And so de facto on the ground in Gaza, that's not a statement that UNRWA is Hamas. I'm not saying this ideological thing that some pros or people say. I think it's a complicated picture, but it's not complicated on the ground in Gaza. And if the world actually cared about Palestinian suffering, UN institutions would at least be doing the right thing. And so Israelis don't believe what's happening at college campuses, don't care what's happening at college campuses. And because they don't believe it, they also don't quite hear it. And I'll say, I'll just end with, with this on this point. If the screaming kids, profoundly ignorant screaming kids on college campuses are, aren't screaming at me because, you know, we speak Hebrew Israelis, we, we don't hear them, then they're screaming at somebody else. And the only audience that I can imagine that, that would actually feel anxiety at what they're doing and therefore is worth the trouble of doing what they're doing are the Jews on campus. And so functionally, even if not in, by some kind of conscious intent, it feels to the Jews uh, anti-Semitic. And um, that is the Israeli view. Now, people, uh, maybe there are people on this call who support them and, and are here just out of curiosity from the other side and think that everything I just said is morally obtuse, but nevertheless, that is, I think, the majority view among the vast majority of Israelis, uh, certainly Israeli Jews. Um, the second question, um, I forgot, I apologize, because I got angry about college campuses. Uh, the, the second question, in a wider war, what role will the United States play? Right. Um, the United States, I think, is beginning to understand, and that's what we're seeing in Yemen, that this Iranian um, proxy war on so many fronts, um, it's beginning to understand that if Iran, as Iran, Iran creates these proxies to push, to reshape the Middle East and to push the war away from the Iranian homeland. And if Iran doesn't suffer direct consequences, then more and more wars will start in more and more places and disrupt global shipping and energy supplies and destabilize a very un unstable region that has already proven the capacity to export its instability elsewhere. And so there's a beginning of an understanding, and Iran is very foolish in, in, in doing this. And I think it's starting to realize how foolish it is, launching its own missiles at Iraq, and suddenly an Iraq that really is under Iran's thumb because of the Shia militias, which are by far the most powerful force in Iraq. Nevertheless, Iraq has now uh, created a real diplomatic spat with Iran and is clarifying to the Iranians that they've overstepped the line. You can't just launch uh, 
ballistic missiles at, at Kurdistan and think that that's okay. And so Iran is overplaying its hand in in Yemen. It's overplaying its hand in Iraq. It's overplaying its hand in Pakistan. And I think that that overplaying has begun to bring the Americans on board with the idea that actually it is also it is not contained. It is not rational. It's a profoundly rational regime, but it has a vision of history that is not the vision of history of the Americans. Um, we I heard you know there was an interview uh, over the past week uh, with Blinken in the New York Times. He was quoted as saying, "Iran has to choose with what kind of future it wants." I hate when American uh, diplomats use language that is that patronizing. Iran has a profound, this regime has a profound and serious and thoughtful vision of history and understanding of its role in it. It is choosing. It is not just a, you know, child that doesn't know what the clever American diplomat uh, knows. Um, and But I think that that kind of quote, which we heard a lot of from Obama, we heard a lot of that from Kerry, we heard a lot of that also from Republican administrations. I think a lot of that um, is is not in fact what the Biden administration is doing on the ground. On the ground, there's a willingness to begin to face down these proxies, to launch airstrikes at the Houthis, to send assets into the region. If the war has begun, the war over Iranian control of the region, America that I am seeing from within Israel is willing to meet that threat. And so Iran has 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 done so much to destroy and destabilize that it has begun to make itself unwelcome for the Americans. And the Americans are finding a lot of allies in the region, Arab, Jewish, and, and everything in between uh, in that. So I, I think the Americans won't have a, a ground war in the Middle East. That is never going to happen. But that's okay, because there's enough people willing to have ground wars in the Middle East. The Americans need to be the strategic depth of that effort. And Iran is making America willing to do that. Aviv Retigur, the Times of Israel uh, senior analyst. We've, As you can see, we've only scratched uh, the surface, uh, but we've gone slightly over time already. So let's uh, end it at, at that. Oh, we had a, a wonderful uh, group of uh, uh, attendees and questions for this uh, webinar, and it's the first of a series. From the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford, thank you and goodbye.